Joining us right now on the Oakland County Megacast is Gabe Karp. He is the operating partner for Detroit Venture Partners. Gabe, thank you so much for being with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Are you finding there are any individuals that maybe their life has been uh, changed due to the pandemic? So now's the time that they're, you know, kind of going out on that limb and deciding to start up their own business? We are. I mean, it, it, you know, you're seeing that, I think, across the country um, and in Detroit. Uh, there's just a lot of excitement um, in the in the startup community in particular. Uh, and yeah, you know, look, the the uh, the economy's been hit pretty hard. Coronavirus has really impacted every day, uh, everything we do every day. Um, and one of the silver linings is that it's really motivating some people who have thought, you know, one of these days I should probably go out and start my own business. Uh, and it, it's a good motivator. So, Gabe, for those not familiar with Detroit Venture Partners, what exactly do you all do over there? So Detroit Venture Partners is a venture capital uh, firm, and it's essentially the venture capital arm of the Quicken Loans family of companies. Um, and venture capital is a little bit different from what you might traditionally think about starting up a small business. Um, Venture-backed businesses are typically ones that uh, certainly start small, but they're intended to, to grow and scale and get really big, uh, as opposed to um, running a lifestyle type business. So at Detroit Venture Partners, we typically see um, technology type businesses. That's, that's where our focus primarily is. Um, and certainly there's also an emphasis on Detroit companies and the, and the, and the local region. I recently saw, a, I think it was a documentary on Netflix or Amazon Prime that was featuring some of the young entrepreneurs in the city of Detroit. And I was surprised to see a lot is going on in the city of Detroit. How have we become a hub and an attraction to some of these young people wanting to start up these tech companies? Yeah, um, it, it's remarkable, uh, the transformation that has gone on in Detroit in terms of particularly in the startup community. You know, you go back 10 years, uh, maybe even a little less than 10 years ago, you just, there was really nothing going on in terms of the startup community. In terms of venture capital, there were zero venture capital funds inside the city of Detroit. Um, and uh, what you know, was traditionally something that people considered, well, that's only in Silicon Valley or maybe on the maybe on the East Coast. Um, and it was unthinkable to do something like that here. Over the past 10 years and really in the past five or six, uh, there's been a dramatic shift. There's now lots of venture capital available at different stages of investment of companies inside Detroit. Uh, there's a thriving community of people who are in uh, technology type uh jobs in other companies, maybe much larger companies, that can have created a talent pool. So I'm talking about software developers, engineers, um, front end developers, that sort of thing. And there's a there's a there's a really active community um, in Detroit with a lot of young people who are networking. Uh, there's a lot of um, a lot of it's very easy to find what jobs are open. It's just, it's a really exciting it's a really exciting time. Gabe Karp with us on the Oakland County Megacast. He's the operating partner for Detroit Venture Partners. How do you pick and choose which companies you're going to back? Because I would imagine you're getting pitches every single day. Uh, yes, definitely getting a lot of pitches. Uh, so we have uh, we have a specific focus, as I said. Certainly, we're we're partial to um, founders in Detroit who, or who are uh, willing to move to Detroit, not just because we're going to invest in them, but because they see the value of, um, of starting a company in the Detroit area. Um, so, you know, the, the, there's a lot of different ways to look at it, investments. Um, and without trying to get too deep in the weeds, sometimes the analogy a lot of people use is horse, jockey, and race. So you look at the, uh, the horse as the type of business that, um, uh, that somebody wants to start, the race would be the industry in which they're moving into, and the jockey is the individual um, founder or founders who are, you know, going to going to ride that horse in that race. And 
I think um, uh, jockey is probably the most important. Um, and that's not to say that uh, the type of company, the industry that they're going into are, are also very important because you want to make sure that there's opportunity there. Um, but the, one of the reasons to focus on the jockey is that starting a business is hard and um, it's, it's lonely and it's painful. And as you start uh, ramping up a business, you're just going to run straight into a brick wall at you know, 100 miles an hour and you may not have even seen it coming. Uh, and the question is, um, are you the kind of job who's going to get back up, dust yourself off, and get right back at it and adapt to what's going on in the market? Um, you know, pivot into a new product line, into a new model, whatever it may be. You want somebody who's really going to be resilient and adaptive to what's happening. So on top of that, so much of a new business sparks from collaboration. And we're in the middle of a pandemic when we're being told to avoid one another. How has that lack of being able to just bounce thoughts and ideas off of one another impacting the growth of some of these companies? Yeah, I think one of the very pleasant surprises is how effective uh, we've all been in a remote work environment. Um, for example, we're conducting this interview over Zoom right now. I, I would say I probably spend, you know, 60% of my day just on Zoom calls. Uh, and I, I gotta say, when when the shutdowns started happening in March, uh, there was there was I don't know if there was concern. There was certainly a question of what's this going to be like, and are we going to be as effective? And I don't think we've skipped a beat, at least at, at, at DDP. And a lot of the companies that uh, that are in our portfolio, that, that I work with the, the founders there, um, things really just continued moving right along. And in fact, uh, what they have found is um, a number of businesses are saving a lot of money on travel and expense budgets. Uh, they don't have to travel to other cities to sell into um, clients. They can just conduct Zoom calls. Um, there's. I do think there's something missing um, in terms of hanging around the water cooler or coffee machine or whatever you want to call it. Uh, those those random bump-ins in the office during the day um, obviously aren't happening, but uh, I know a number of companies, including ours, uh, we just have a, a standing half-hour Zoom call every day. And a lot of it's to talk about um, some things that we're continuing to work on, but it's also just time to just decompress and talk about what's going on in the news or uh, or sports or personal stuff. Um, and that that sort of organic interaction has continued virtually. So it's uh, it's kind of exciting because I, I think what some people thought initially might be a limiting factor has actually been quite the opposite. It's, it's somewhat expansive. Gabe Karp with us. He's the operating partner at Detroit Venture Partners, joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. And Gabe, you mentioned the cost-cutting uh, benefits of remote work over the course of the pandemic. Have you also found, at least uh, within the companies that DVP oversees or is involved with, have you seen that it's also increased productivity or maybe reduced productivity? What's been the result of that in terms of remote work? Sure. Um, it's, it's been somewhat of a mixed bag, but I would say for many of the companies that, um, that I'm involved with, there really hasn't been a difference at all because before the pandemic, um, there already was remote work uh, procedures in place. Um, you know, we we have companies that uh, may be headquartered in one place, but they've hired people in other cities. Um, and it's kind of just the normal way that they've been working. Uh, I would say that on, uh, you know, you mentioned overseas work, um, for companies that are doing a lot of software engineering, software development, uh, there has been an outsourcing model that's really probably a decade old now, where um, a lot of the a lot of maybe like chunks of coding and and some software development or product development that is lower level can be outsourced overseas, um, India, Ukraine. Uh, even in South America, Central America, and uh, and then that work is done maybe overnight, uh, not in Central America, but overnight in U Ukraine or India, and then the next day, uh, the dev team in the U.S. who's inside the company can pick up with that base amount of work that was done and really refine it and build it. Um, 
that that's not a new model to the pandemic, uh, but it's certainly one that um, has has been enabled and certainly not impacted by the pandemic. So as you had mentioned, uh, so many people are working remotely right now, and while there are a lot of benefits to it, I worry about the downfall that the long-term impact of working remotely can have on the city of Detroit itself, because Detroit Venture Partners, founded by Dan Gilbert, Quicken Loans, huge supporter of the city of Detroit, and moving the team back down into the city of Detroit. He and the Illages are you know, largely being credited with Detroit's comeback and the growth that we're seeing in the city of Detroit. But now if we have people working remotely, what's going to be the long-term impact on the city of Detroit and the area of businesses and the restaurants? Because if I'm sitting at home, I'm not going to meet my coworkers, you know, after work for that happy hour drink, or I'm not going to the new restaurant and picking up my lunch. So from that standpoint, I know it's not really in your your wheelhouse, but are there any discussions about what this could mean long term for the city of Detroit? Yeah, uh, I mean that's certainly a topic of discussion, and there's a there's just tremendous excitement around all of it. And the the viewpoint, well, I'll tell you the viewpoint, the viewpoint that I have is that this pandemic is is really bad. Uh, it's difficult, but it is temporary. And we're already, you know, the news coming out. I mean, I heard you just talking about um, uh, developments on the vaccine. You know, this is whether whether it's uh, four months from now, six months from now, eight months from now, um, it's going to end. And when it does, you're going to see people flooding back into the city. I think that the um, the benefits that we see with remote working and and virtual uh, conferences and that sort of thing, that's going to continue, but it'll just be a hybrid. I mean, look, I think it's a great thing for um, businesses to be able to offer that kind of flexibility to employees. Maybe they don't come to work uh, nine to five every single day of the week. Um, maybe some days they can spend more hours at home, but on a regular basis, uh, every day and every week, you're going to have people inside the um, inside the physical offices of a business, and there may also be remote workers at the same time, and they'll probably shuffle in and out um, and trade off. So the uh, the restaurant scene downtown, um, you know, we, we think about live, work, and play, and creating that type of community in Detroit. Uh, th there's no there's no real concern that that's in any jeopardy in the long term, and in fact, the excitement continues to build uh, and and no pun intended the word build i mean we see construction going down on downtown and uh you know one of the largest potentially i'm not sure if it's going to be the tallest building sometimes it is it depends on who the last tenant is but at the old hudson site you know that's a massive project and that is full steam ahead um and uh you're you're not going to be building that if if there's a, a concern that five years from now ten years from now everybody's going to be tucked away in their homes working Gabe Karp with us on the, the Oakland County Megacast. He's the operating partner for Detroit Venture Partners. So knowing that, uh, because I do wonder, it, in some ways, if, you, if I'm a new employer, I can offer hybrid or remote learning, some type of hybrid situation like we're seeing going on with the schools right now, to our employees. So it could be a selling point to some of them for you to be able to get um, better employees or more qualified employees that maybe wouldn't be interested in driving all the way into the city of Detroit or wherever your offices may be. Um, but uh, long term down the road coming out of the pandemic, what do you think? How is this long term going to change uh, the business scene and what we're actually looking for as far as businesses um, in the COVID-19 crisis? Sure. Uh I think business is going to continue to grow. Um, I know we're in the middle of a, a big uh, uh, political change with with the election and, and a, a new president elect. That, regardless of how um, anyone feels about politics or uh, who is in the White House, you have, no one has ever lost betting on the U.S. economy long term. And when we look at the city of Detroit, for example, which is a, a great uh, microcosm of what we're seeing elsewhere. 
you know, Detroit has undergone some very difficult times in the past and is, is in the in the a renaissance of some real exciting growth. So uh, we're absolutely going to continue to see more and more companies uh, starting in Detroit, um, coming from outside the area, moving to Detroit. Um, one of the advantages of, of the city and the area is that the cost of living is lower than in Silicon Valley. Um, and that impacts, uh, that will, that allows uh, founders of companies to ramp up really high quality teams um, for a fraction of the cost of what you'd be paying out in, uh, in Mountain View, California or, or somewhere like that, not, not, to, not to give those cities a hard time. Uh, and then, of course, you got to remember that uh, we have amazing world-class educational institutions, University of Michigan, Michigan State University, and, and the list goes on, pumping out really amazing talent year after year. And whereas maybe 10 years ago that talent would um, leave and go to the coasts or maybe even to Chicago, now they're staying. And in fact, you're seeing people from outside the region that didn't even go to those schools, uh, went to other great schools in other areas of the country coming into Detroit. So, yeah, we're going to have more uh, more remote work, um, as you mentioned. That's simply a perk to be able to offer that kind of flexibility to people coming uh, coming to work for your company if, if you want to start one. Uh, and again, the, the, while that is convenient and there are perks there, it's also just so great to be in an office and be with people when it's when it's lunchtime. Go out into the street and go to a restaurant. Um, support local businesses. People just enjoy doing that. Um, and while sometimes they may want to just chill out in their house, other times they definitely want to get out in, in the world and interact. So, you know, very very long roundabout answer to your uh, to kind of the question of well, what do we what do we see moving forward. Gabe Carp with us. He's the operating partner at Detroit Venture Partners with us today on the Oakland County Megacast. And Gabe, you were also with us recently at the Greater West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce's Virtual Innovative Business Event, or VIBE, where you, uh, where you delivered a presentation on our main stage called the Conflict Cleanse. And during these times where people are under so much pressure in their daily life and just from what's going on in the world, on top of that in the office, we can see that you can see a situation where a conflict in the workplace could potentially become more of a detriment than it would have been previously. But there is good conflict and bad conflict. Uh, based on what you presented, and, and of course anybody can see that presentation from Vibe on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash Civic Center TV 15. What is good conflict in the workplace, especially during COVID-19? versus bad conflict and how can one be productive and other be extremely detrimental at the worst? Sure. Um, you know, uh, whenever human beings interact, there's, there's going to be conflict. And um, good conflict is the kind of conflict that promotes growth. And that's growth for us as individuals. It's growth as business. Uh, it's um, in a, let's say, in the workplace, maybe there's a disagreement between two people about how something um how a project is moving along maybe someone's kind of annoyed with some with another person saying you know that person's not really carrying their weight um i would say a bad conflict would be for that person to hold it in and and just let it faster and build and that creates some resentment uh i think healthy conflict is um promoted by an environment where someone who's annoyed with something or has a has an issue and wants to get something off their chest um they're free to do it without the stigma of being associated with you know being that person who initiates conflict how is a good thing and if we have a difference of opinion on anything i think uh it's great when we can attack our ideas and attack the issues and attack the problems and not attack character or personality, or you know, us is who we are, and that's kind of the that's the big difference. You know, if if I've got a problem and it's an uncomfortable conversation, that, and I need to bring it up with somebody, uh, as long as I approach it with respect, um, and I am, am not only respectful of the other person, but I'm respectful of sort of the environment that we're in, and I say, hey, look, I I have an issue. Um, this is the issue. I'd like to discuss it, and there's that enables a free exchange of ideas. Yeah, I think one of the good things coming out of this crisis 
it's no longer business as usual because too many times individuals and businesses get so comfortable in the way that they do things. It's like, this is the way we've always done it. Instead of being forced to learn new ways and to grow, so that could be a good positive that comes out of this because there is no company and no business right now operating the same way that they were prior to COVID-19. Yeah, I would say, you know, that, that kind of touches on a, another point that's worth making. And that is that um, people make mistakes. That's just, we're human beings, so that's just gonna happen. And that's certainly gonna happen in the workplace. And sometimes people make mistakes that are bad and maybe they, cost the company a client or, or you know, even worse. Um, but one of the problems with, uh, one of the big misconceptions in business is that conflict is a bad thing that should be avoided at all costs. And mistakes or contradictory opinions, um, they're frowned upon and they're, they're seen as badges of shame. When in fact, uh, the ability to raise an issue and talk about a mistake is what's gonna make that company grow. Because, I mean, think about it like this. If you're in a culture where mistakes are frowned upon and when someone, make, if, and there's a heavy emphasis on that, if somebody does make a mistake, they'll be highly motivated to keep it covered up for as long as possible. Um, but there's another thing that's also important and that's to honor uh, candor and accountability. Because again, look, we're human, we are going to make mistakes, that's inevitable. And one of the true tests of character of not only individuals, but an organization is how do we react once we recognize that we've made a mistake? Um, now that's not to say that, uh, that, that you know, quality execution isn't also important and should be valued, but you wanna have an environment where when someone makes a mistake, it's okay to call it out to that person. And that person doesn't feel threatened when called out. Uh, and there, there are lots of things that can be done in a culture to make that more comfortable. We only grow when we do make mistakes and we learn and we grow from those mistakes. Uh, knowing that, I know that you back several young companies. Any tips on what types of companies an individual should look at investing in right now? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, generally we look at companies that, um, as I mentioned before, in, in tech, more, the more tech type stuff, uh, and companies that enable businesses to grow and scale. You know, we're, and let me sort of uh, decode that. Uh, we're seeing a lot of industries that are continually being disrupted. It's sort of like each industry's turn um, to be disrupted. Um, right now, the, the financial industry is seeing disruption in various, uh, in various areas. Banking is an example. You know, it used to be that there were only a handful of very large uh, global banks that serviced everybody's not only business but but personal banking needs. And now you're seeing other businesses popping up all the time. Um, you know, you're seeing uh, in the in the uh, mainly millennials uh, kind of leading the charge um, in how money is just being moved. Things like Venmo and uh, Chase Pay or Zelle, you know, the, the fact that kids, um, kids, the fact that young adults don't even really carry that much cash anymore. You know, those are all businesses that saw, uh, saw an industry and in something that's been done for decades, if, if not even centuries about how money moves and just said, we're gonna disrupt the whole thing. Um, we're gonna make it so you don't even need cash anymore. And, and you know, lots of other industries um, have evolved and developed and progressed. Uh, so we have hardware, you know, we all carry around these phones that do just such amazing things. So on top of those phones, you can run entirely new businesses, like for example, with, with money. Uh, we're seeing similar things in insurance, uh, how to get car insurance, how to get home insurance. Um, we're seeing, uh, you know, in the medical field, DDP doesn't look so much in the medical field, but uh, you know, prescription drugs online. That was really unthinkable 10 years ago. Uh, I mean, I, I could continue doing this for probably a couple hours, so. But no, I even uh, saw a special yesterday and they were, um, engineers were in a hospital trying to help them streamline their process for even how to stock their supplies. So the, the and it's all led by these, like you said, young kids, they're not kids, but they are young 
um, you know, 20 something year olds that are really leading the charge in this new world of this tech company. I mean, we really should have seen the writing on the wall when Honest John, the homeless guy at Eight Mile in Woodward, now has a square. Uh, so if you pull up, he's not asking you for cash. When you say, oh, I don't have any cash, he's like, that's okay, I have a square. Donate <laughs> to me. Um, you know, so when the homeless are getting on board with this, it really is time for the rest of the world to try to jump on board with changing technology as well. And I'll leave you with this one last question, because while you are focused on new young businesses, and I would imagine a lot of those employees are also on the younger side, what about older people who now have a boss that's like 28, 29, 30 years old? How do they bridge that gap to try to relate to the younger generation if that younger generation becomes your boss? Yeah, and that's a uh, look. That's just the reality of the of the world we're in right now. Um, but I got to tell you, I I've seen really great, um, really great matchups between you know maybe a, a young you know a young entrepreneur who you know grown a business and has these amazing ideas, and then you when you pair that uh, when you pair that entrepreneur with someone who's older and who's been around um, and has some maturity has experience and can leverage that experience and you know yes there, there's a hierarchy there uh but the you know the person from the older generation um is able to is able to really help uh the young entrepreneur and see things from a different perspective and when when the young entrepreneurs are open and receptive to getting that kind of feedback uh it's great that's a that's a two plus two equals five scenario um, so those, those are the opportunities. Now, look, I, I do understand that um, there's a uh, there's a there's a pride uh, there's a pride and an ego thing there because it used to be that everybody's boss was always a lot older, um, and it just it just takes an adjustment. And when we can look at anyone, regardless of their age, and appreciate whatever value they're bringing to the table. Um, and we can kind of carve out some space to show the value that, that we also can bring. Uh, a, a lot of that, a lot of those negative feelings, just they just go away. They really do. Um, it does require that everybody have a healthy dose of curiosity, going not only to every relationship but every conversation, uh, and that makes things a lot better. I, I mean, just, I'm going to go off on a tangent real quick because at that live event, there was uh, they were talking about you know the political discourse and how it's so hard to have uh, a conversation with, with someone that's even really close to you, a friend or loved one, um, about politics because it's such, a, such an emotionally charged issue. And what I have found is that when people enter a political discussion with the goal of curiosity, it changes everything. Um, and it, if you have a minute, I can sort of explain that. What I typically see, sorry, I keep the sun is coming through the window, so I keep backing up. What I, what I typically see is that people enter into these political discussions with the mindset of, I have an opinion, I know I'm right. My goal is to basically convince this other person I'm talking to that I am right. And so my goal is that they're gonna say, you know what, after everything you said, I have decided to change my opinion. Um, well, when two people go into the conversation with that same goal, you're just going to get a lot of headbutting. But if instead of going into a conversation in, uh, with the goal of trying to persuade the other person to adopt your point of view, um, you instead take the take the approach that um, you know what? I'm just going to be curious about this. I want to understand what this person thinks and why they think it, and that's going to that's going to promote all kinds of behavior that you don't even need to think about. You'll start asking questions. Um, your tone of voice will be different because you'll be coming from a place of curiosity uh, than, than one of persuasion. Uh, and the reality is, is that when you enter any conversation with curiosity like that, uh, you leave that conversation smarter. You just know more. Um, so th that, that's, that's sort of one way to deal with these difficult political conversations. And then going back to what you were talking about, you know, when you have somebody who's maybe got a boss who's a lot younger than they are, um, when you approach the dynamic with curiosity to learn, it, it just makes you smarter. And, uh, and it encourages the other person to do the same. 
Well, those are great words to leave on. Thank you so much for sharing them and your wisdom and all your knowledge as well. Gabe Carp with us on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the operating partner for Detroit Venture Partners. I know this has been a crazy time uh, for you and your team as well. Happy Zoom Day, <laughs> as we've been saying every single day since the beginning of this pandemic. It'll be nice when we can all get together and maybe one day we can have you actually in the studio as well. Great. Thanks so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure.